I was watching Ancient Aliens the other day. That's how this video happened. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the War Launch. In 1963, a Turkish farmer in Cappadocia was renovating his home when he discovered something very strange. His chickens, which are not what this is, his chickens would keep disappearing into a crack in one of his walls and not coming back. Now, he, he knew that the crack could lead into some sort of, uh, you know, cave system or whatnot, but when he actually did do the renovations to fix up the hole in the wall, he discovered something else, an entire underground city known as Darren Kuyu. Since 1963, as archaeological excavations have gone on, they have revealed over 600 entrances to this cave system, most of them located within private homes. Now, sitting several hundred feet beneath the famous fairy mounds of Cappadocia in Turkey is what is believed to be an 18-level, 85-meter-deep underground city, and we don't know when it was built. We know that it was inhabited up until 1923. We know the Byzantines were involved. We know that the Phrygians were involved, and it seems likely that even the Hittites got in on this action. But we don't know for certain when it started, and we're going to talk about that city today. It's believed that most, if not all, of Derinkuyu is currently known to archaeologists, and almost all of it has been excavated. Although there are still rumors of things like tunnels that span miles and miles to the next underground city because yeah there's more of them but as it stands today Darren Kuyu isn't just a, a bunker this isn't just like some sort of ancient fallout shelter this is a city that had stables livestock pens houses oil presses storage for wine and olive oil and even disposal areas for dead bodies as well as a 55 meter deep ventilation shaft that was once a well serving the entire community there are dry cellars, dining halls, and chapels. As far as anyone can tell, this is a fully functional underground city, but dwarves don't exist, so why does it? But aside from the simple facts of the city, you know, the types of rooms that are in it, the depth, the fact that it could house 20,000 people at its peak, very little is actually known about the foundation of the city, who founded it, and why they founded it. And it's not that we don't have theories. Archaeologists do believe that they probably know what it was, but historical facts are pesky little things that are ever-changing as new evidence is uncovered. So perhaps the best place to start with any discussion of this underground city is, how old is it? Well, there's one very accepted hypothesis, which is that the city itself was constructed by the Phrygians. You might be wondering who the Phrygians are. Well, if you're not a uh, scholar of ancient history, as in pre-classical era, you probably won't know. You might have heard the term Phrygian cap, because they were commonly worn, into the Middle Ages, but you might not know who the Phrygians really were. Well, the theory goes that in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, the Phrygians, who had moved over into Anatolia long before that, decided they were going to construct this underground city. Now, why is unclear? Because by the 8th and 7th centuries, the Phrygians were pretty well established in the region. They were their own kingdom. They were not, like, newcomers. They weren't really worried about small little raids here and there. And they were perfectly capable of building walled cities. So... Maybe Darren Kuyu was there when they got there. You see, the Phrygians are an Indo-European people who are believed to have originated in the Balkans, northwest of Macedonia. But they got over to Anatolia around 1180 BC, it's believed. Now, we know they were there by the 8th century BC, but a number of records from various kingdoms do suggest that they were there a lot earlier. You see, there is a very distinctive style of pottery called bukkakeramik, called if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, or it might be Bukelkeramik. Uh, I can't tell for certain. I believe it's a German term. And the presence of this pottery is not what's curious, because it comes from the Balkans. It's a typical Balkan pottery. It's the where of the pottery, which is Troy 7b. Now, for those of you who didn't know, Troy was a real city, Ilios in Greek, and... It is believed to be in northwestern Anatolia, really just right over by the Dardanelles. Like, it's it's on the western extremity. It was never fully controlled by the Hittite Empire of the, uh, we'll say, 17th through 12th centuries BC. Like, very, very early 12th. They kind of collapsed at the end of uh, the 13th. But the fact that Phrygian pottery is present at Troy 7b, a lair of the city which dates to 1180 BC, 
or directly after the Greeks supposedly sacked it, does suggest that the Phrygians were in fact there, and that they probably came in and inhabited the very decimated Troy. But we don't have linguistic elements, and the Phrygians spoke a language related to Greek and wrote in an alphabet that was very similar to the Greek alphabet. So the lack of any Phrygian language there does mean it could have been another Balkan group who used the same kind of pottery, but it, it seems to make sense that it would in fact be the Phrygians. You see, while we don't have literary evidence of the Phrygians in Anatolia in 1180 BC, we do have literary evidence from the Assyrians about probably the Phrygians in 1180 BC. You see, the Assyrian king, and I am going to absolutely butcher this, Tiglas Pileser I, refers to an event in which he defeated a people known as the Mushki. You see, the Assyrian king, Tiglath Pileser I, refers to an event in the early 12th century BC where he defeated a group of people he calls the Mushki. Now, Mushki would be a term that people of the Near East and the Middle East would later apply to the Phrygians. Could it have been a separate Balkan group? Yes. Are there any records of a different Balkan group? No. According to the available evidence, it is probably the Phrygians. If you can't tell, this entire story is one big mystery with a lot of little bits and pieces of evidence here and there. So from basically 900 BC to 690 BC, the Phrygians were the dominant kingdom in Anatolia. They had replaced the Hittites who had fallen during the Bronze Age collapse, and they were essentially the, the big players in the region until the kingdom of Samaria, up across the Black Sea, came down and conquered them. They then existed as part of the Lydian kingdom from about 690 BC, into 546 BC when they were conquered by the Persians, which is basically when everyone was conquered by the Persians. It is believed that King Midas of Greek legend may have been a Phrygian, although it is also possible that that is identifying him improperly due to another king with the name Mita'a from a previous period. But here's the rub with the idea that the Phrygians are the ones who started the work on Darren Kuyu. The Phrygians were wall builders. They were architects. They were engineers. They were basically on par with the Greeks of the time. So why bother building underground when you could build above ground? It's much easier to build walls and vertical structures than it is to dig into the earth. Now, we're talking about volcanic ash that has been compacted over millions of years, so it's not like you're chopping through granite, but it still would make more sense to build up, not down. And in the sole account from the classical period, that mentions underground dwellings, the Anabasis by Xenophon, who was a general of a company called the 10,000, they were a mercenary company, he was one of the generals amongst them, and he recorded the entire history of this war with Persia. Now, he was not fighting for the Greeks at the time, it was just kind of an inter-kingdom dispute, but he describes underground dwellings, but these are like little underground dwellings, single family. He's not talking about entire extensive cities, and had he marched through this area, it's not just Darren Kuyu that's underground. There are hundreds of these underground cities. Most of them are only two levels deep, but some of them are, I think it's 40 of them, or at least three levels deep, and Darren Kuyu is believed to be 18 levels deep. So, if this was something that was, like, commonly inhabited at the time, it seems likely that Xenophon would have known about it and probably would have written about it, but he didn't which implies that maybe either he didn't find them or that they weren't really in use or that they were really effective. Because Darren Kuyu isn't just an underground city in the middle of a plain. No, it's an underground city with a town on top of it. So it just may be that when the Greek armies marched through, they didn't notice that there was an entire underground city. They might have thought, you know, ah, it's weird that everybody's hiding in their houses right now, but we are an army, so... So they may not have, it might not have registered for them what was going on. But if the Phrygians were the ones who built these underground cities, it seems likely that they were expanding on what was already there. And that leads us into the Hittite hypothesis. Now, you gotta ask yourself, who were the Hittites? Well, they were a Bronze Age civilization that was so old and so unknown by the time of writers like Herodotus in the 5th century BC that he didn't know about them. And Herodotus, like, his whole thing was not just telling the Greek story, but telling the stories of everyone else. That when he told the story about Greeks, he also would mention, oh, and the Phoenicians, who were these people, and the Egyptians, who were these people. And he doesn't mention the Hittites 
even once. The furthest back he goes is the Phrygians. So, by the time, by the 5th century, keep in mind, 5th century is not that long after the Phrygians had been conquered by Persia. Nobody knows about the Hittites. So nobody knew about this Indo-European speaking people who were just right across the sea from the Mycenaeans and the Minoans, who probably, who definitely interacted with the Egyptians, with the Phoenicians, with a number of other groups. They're even mentioned in the Bible, but nobody in the Western world knew about these people, I kid you not, until 1834. This civilization that lasted from about 1750 BC up to about 1190 BC, I mean, that's, that's a long period of time, was not known to the modern world, even back to the classical world. Plato did not know about these people. Nobody knew about it until 1834. So, for the longest time, there's just this weird group of people called the Hittites in the Bible, and nobody knew who they were. Now, today, a lot of scholars suggest that the Hittites of the Bible and the Hittites that we talk about up in Anatolia are not the same group. I think that's stupid. Like, like actually, it's it's stupid, because the, the place where the Hittites in the Bible are said to be is exactly smack dab where the Hittites would have been. And these references are Abraham. Like, we're, we're talking about people who were pre-Egyptian captivity. We're talking about, like, you know, 1700 to 2000 BC. So the Hittites in the Bible, pretty solidly probably the same Hittites in Anatolia. I don't know why you would deny this unless your goal is to discredit the Bible as a historical work, which you would only do after all of the research that has been done if you have a bone to pick with the religion. So, let me tell you, as a historian, as somebody who does this for a living, it is really dumb to throw out the idea that the Hittites of the Bible and the Hittites of Anatolia are different groups of people. There is not solid evidence for that. I, I'm sorry for the rant, but I had to say it. Like, you know, I'm not I'm not claiming that the Bible is, like, you know, right about everything. You don't have to believe in religion to, to look at it. But sometimes, you know what, it's okay. It's okay that the Jews got something right. Like, that is all right. That is an okay thing to believe. You don't have to be anti-Semitic. I know it's hard. I know sometimes it's really hard to be a decent person. But in this case, the facts are there. You you don't, you, you if, if at the decent, if at the bad person meetings, you feel like you have to like lie to people about the, the Hittite empire because you, you don't want to acknowledge that the Jews got something right. That's okay. But you have the facts to back you up on this one. You can actually blame me. You can actually blame the historical community. We did this. We, we, we showed that the Jews were right. Cool? Cool. But outside of the Bible, there were references to the Hittites. We just couldn't read them because they were written in cuneiform. And cuneiform wasn't actually deciphered until 1857 AD. So when French explorer Charles Texier discovered the Hittite ruins that he was investigating in 1834, he did not know what to make of them. It was only after the deciphering of cuneiform that people started to get, oh, this is a civilization that we didn't know about. This is different from the other ones. This is older than the Greeks. This is older than the Persians. This is, this is old stuff. And so they started investigating that and discovered that, oh my god, there was an entire culture here that we didn't know about, which I think is really cool. And it's kind of why I laugh at people who are like, Atlantis couldn't have been real. Probably a lot of stuff that's real that we don't know about yet. Now, is the Atlantis Plato talks about accurate? I mean, concentric rings of circles, pillars of Heracles, uh, maybe. To be clear, if there was an Atlantis, I think it was probably like a Bronze Age civilization, but 10,000 years earlier. Like, that's where I'm sitting with Atlantis, if that makes sense. I'm not, I don't think they had flying cars. So the Hittites are a very powerful empire. They control most of Anatolia, basically from Armenia to the coastline of the Aegean, either through their controlled territory or the territory of allied client states. I mean, this is a big empire with a lot of resources and at the dawn of wall building. You see, walls were there in like 2000 BC, like some cities had walls. But they were not, we, we're not in the stage of every major city in Europe and the Near East having a wall yet. We're in the phase of, like, citadels. Like, walled enclosures at the center of a city that are meant to draw everyone in in times of danger. Kind of like a medieval castle. So, there might have been reason for a group of people like the Hittites or their immediate proto-Hittite predecessors to build underground defenses, to build fortifications that did not require walls. And Darren Kuyu is in the dead center of former Hittite territory. 
And on top of that, some Hittite artifacts have been found within Darren Kuyu. Now, does that mean that they were down there because the Hittites were down there? Not necessarily. It could be that later cultures collected various ancient to them treasures within Darren Kuyu. That's another possibility. But if the Phrygians did not bring Hittite artifacts into Darren Kuyu, that means that it was probably the Hittites that at least started construction. But that just tells us how old it is. That doesn't tell us why Darren Kuyu was built. Darren Kuyu was in use until 1923 when Greek Christian Cappadocians were eventually exchanged with Muslims uh, and, and, you know, Balkan Turks in a population exchange between Greece and the newly founded Turkish country in 1923. Now, it seems likely that they were put back into use at some point, that they hadn't been in wide use until 1909, when a massacre of Armenian Christians, resulting in many Christians living throughout Turkey, seeking other options than living above ground. They needed places to hide. Now, this is actually probably pretty similar to what was going on in the early Christian period when Christians would meet underground. They wouldn't necessarily live underground, but they would go to church in catacombs or in caves or in basements, things like that. So, it seems like Christians in Turkey, seeking to avoid the Armenian genocide being expanded, took, took shelter in places like Derinkuyu. And this was not a new practice for Christians in Turkey. When the Arabs and the Turks had invaded Byzantine territory between the 8th century AD and the 12th century AD, they would often take shelter in these underground cities. They saw wide use during the Byzantine period, including pretty massive expansion, and there's lots of architectural examples of the Byzantine style of art and building being functional within Derinkuyu. So that tells us what the later uses for the underground city were, but what about earlier uses? Well, there's a number of accepted ones. Due to the narrowness of the passageways, the fact that they had large rolling stone doors that could only be locked from the inside, and a number of other mechanisms, such as that ventilation shaft with the well, which could easily be closed off to the, uh, the above-ground world from below, it seems like this was definitely a fortification. That at some point in Darren Kuyu's history, they decided this was going to be used as a defense mechanism. Now, as a defense against raids, it makes a lot of sense. You can quickly go underground, you can hide, and at the very least, you're safe. But in the event of a siege, you can only last so long. So it is possible that you might be able to bring in food from the outside through any of these entrances that are not within the town of Derinkuyu, which sits on top. But in the event of a siege, chances are you're really going to be stuck with whatever you can keep down there with you. Storage. And of course, we know they had storage for olive oil, they had storage for wine, they had dry storage, they had all sorts of places that you could store food. But how old are those? We don't know. We're not sure at what point each phase of the city was starting. We know that the city must have started from the top, but how, how far down did they get before the Byzantine period? Because the Byzantines renovated it a lot. So, the town might be able to withstand a short siege, but again, why not walls? I mean, we, we do have walls, small ones, again, citadel-type walls, in Anatolia around 2300 BC. So is Darren Kuyu older than that? Was Darren Kuyu not important enough to have walls? Who knows? It seems like, for whatever reason, either this town was not important enough or uh, did not have the resources to build walled structures. So, underground they went. So, while it would very well work as a defense against raids, how long of a siege could you really deal with down here? Probably not super long, you know, a, a siege in that period for that population, you'd just be more likely to surrender at a certain point. You know, Darren Kuyu was not a capital city of any kind. I can't really think of a reason why they would need an extensive cave complex to avoid siege craft. So we've got two real uses for Darren Kuyu, one of them more modern and the other one very, very old, seemingly a defense against raids. But there are questions that remain. So while we have two real accepted uses for Darren Kuyu, one being a refuge from genocide, and the other being a refuge from raids and possibly siege warfare, but that seems rather unlikely to me personally, there are questions that remain about Darren Kuyu. We have an idea when it was built, we have an idea who built it, and we have an idea why it was built. We don't have concrete answers for any of these things. For example, when and how was it first constructed? We know that 
it was definitely there for the Phrygians. It was probably there for the Hittites, but was it there before the Hittites? Was anything there? What was its original purpose? It seems most likely that it was about 1500 BC that construction began. You know, we had bronze tools at the time, it's volcanic ash. If the Egyptians could build the pyramids, the Hittites could dig out Darankuyu. Although copper could also probably do the job, so that stretches the feasible timeline back to 3500 BC, but most likely we're looking at 1500 or after. Which leads to the question of who built it? Well, if it was built around 1500, that's solidly the Hittites. If it was later, it's solidly the Phrygians, but it seems like it wasn't in consistent use under the Persians, so it really has to be the Phrygians or the Hittites, but we don't know which of them it was, and we still don't really know why. But it is possible that while they didn't use them, the Persians may have known about them, and they may not have even known that they knew about them. You see, in the Venedad, which is one of the uh, scriptural works of the Zoroastrian religion, which is one of the world's oldest monotheistic religions with extant information to about 600 BC and a probable founding of about 1500 BC, similar to Judaism, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're looking at contemporary here. Well, the Venedad mentions a Persian mythical king known as Yima, who is the first person to whom uh, Ahura Mazda speaks before he talks to Zarathustra, who is the guy who found Zoroastrianism. So prior to this, and, and this is how this comes about in the, the writing, is that Zarathustra asks, did you speak to anybody before me? And he says, well, yeah, I talked to this guy Yima. And then he tells this story of how Yima was this legendary great king who oversaw an incredible peace during which the world actually had to be enlarged, which if you want to look back into, you know, geological history, we might be hearing a discussion of this mythological king overseeing a period under which the glaciers receded. That's how I'm looking at this is like, this could possibly be, you know, a callback to like 11,600 years ago. But this, this King Yima, who again, the, the Persian empire is not founded until like 600 BC. That's when we first start to see uh, the, the Persians expanding out of Iran. Now, the Venedad tells a story of how Yima was told that after all of this massive period of growth, there was going to be a winter and it was gonna be bad and a lot of people were gonna die, but they could shelter in underground dwellings. Now, Yima would have to build these, but once he had them built, he could take the fittest of the men, of the women, of the animals, and they could go hide underground as long as they needed to and survive that way. So he builds himself this underground uh, complex and they go and spend their time down there and they wait out the glacial age, the, the, the cold snap, the ongoing winter that has driven them underground. I'm not saying that the Venedad is absolutely talking about Darren Kuyu. I'm not saying that. But there are enough similarities there that you gotta wonder, did the Persians as early as 600 BC know about Darankuyu or one of its associated cities without actually knowing about Darankuyu? It seems possible. It's not confirmed, but it does seem possible. But the real, the real question here, because like I said, I I'm trying to make this sound mysterious, but for the most part, we have a good, eye, a good handle on a lot of this. It's why. The question is still why. At a time when walls were possible, at a time when you had written language, why build it? Does it predate these things? I, I mean, m most cities of the Phrygian period, at the very least, were walled. By the latter end of the Hittite period, cities were definitely walled. So it would have to be early Hittite construction to not have walls simply because walls weren't a thing. But if Darankuyu was important enough to house a complex underground city, why did it not have walls? If it were that important, feasibly you would expect them to build fortifications on the surface before looking to go underground, which again implies that the underground portion may have been built before walls were a thing, or that Darankuyu was not important enough to have walls, but again, if it was not important enough to have walls, why was it important enough to have an underground city? There's a lot of things here that just contradict each other. E each piece of information that clarifies one thing seems to contradict another. And if we look to what the Greeks were doing under the Ottomans and the Turks, is it possible that these were entirely functional underground cities that just collaborated with the above ground one? Were they going in and out? Were there people living down here because it made more sense than expanding the city's limits? It's possible. I mean, as long as the above ground world is functional and you're not at war, living underground is actually completely possible. 
There's no reason they couldn't have done it. In fact, it might have been a good storage area for a lot of different kinds of goods. So in peacetime, when you have access to farmland and trade goods and merchants, it's perfectly rational. But in wartime, this doesn't seem like the kind of thing that could be inhabited. There has to have been above ground population, or at least above ground farming and industry, for Darren Kuyu to have worked. So, as we know with most structures, we get agriculture first. So why agriculture then underground city? It's a valid question. And that leads us to another question, which is, if the primary purpose of Darren Kuyu was siege or legitimate peacetime underground city, why are there so many of them? There's over 200 of these underground cities. If we look and we, we recognize that underground city is really a strategy that does not work long term, why were there so many? Could it be due to the uniqueness of the Hittite culture? Because the Phrygians weren't underground city people. We're not talking about dwarves here. Could it, been, could, could it be the uniqueness of the Hittite culture? Could it be proto-Hittite? Could this have been something before they were the dominant power there? Could it have to do with the unique geography of the region? I mean, look at the look at the fairy mounds. They're not normal. Could it be due to the volcanic ash that made the ground so soft? Could it be that hauling the stone in to build walls was going to take more labor, more manpower than simply digging into the ground and doing things that way? Like I said, it's a mystery. It's, it's not like a paranormal mystery. It's not a, you know, a precursor civilization mystery, but there's a lot of weird questions to be asked here. And then another important question, are these cities actually connected by very, 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 very long underground tunnels? And if they are connected by very, very, very long underground tunnels, as is rumored, how did they build those? How the hell do you organize a multi-mile long underground tunnel with, with Bronze Age technology? It seems utterly impossible. You would basically have to build the tunnel as a trench and then fill it in for that to work. So if these underground tunnels that are rumored to exist do in fact connect Darren Kuyu to Kaimelik or to, uh, there's another one named um, Matiate. If they actually do connect these cities, how did they pull that off? That's gonna be the bigger question in my opinion. If they find tunnels that connect these cities, then we're looking at something weird. I mean, there, there's one lingering question here, which is, could the city be older than we think? There's very little evidence that it is. But there's also very little evidence that it was built in the first place, because the Byzantines basically washed away everything when they renovated. As far as we know, Darren Kuyu is the largest, but we also don't know that it is the oldest. It is entirely possible that some of the other cities in the region are older. Or it could be that Darren Kuyu was the first one and it was the model. More questions have arisen since Matiate was discovered in May of this year, 2022. But as far as they're aware, that city only dates back to the 3rd century BC. So it might have been modeled off of Darren Kuyu, but if it was constructed in the 3rd century BC and nobody knew about Darren Kuyu, sorry, not BC, 80, uh, it, it just, it, it's a confusing question. So it's weird. But if it is the oldest and if it is older than the Hittites, that would explain the lack of walls. And I know maybe I sound really hung up on the lack of walls thing here, but like, it's weird that it doesn't have walls, but it does have an extensive underground siege defense. Like that is strange. I don't think it's anything paranormal. I don't think it's anything like precursor civilization, like I said earlier, but I, I feel like there's mysteries within those walls that we haven't yet unlocked. But I would love to know what you guys think, especially if there are any archeologists or anthropologists watching this, let me know what you guys think of it as well, because as a historian, my work is essentially built off of your work. So if you like what we're doing here at uh, the Lore Lodge, Aiden is laughing uncontrollably behind the camera and I don't know why, so we're gonna figure that out in a second. But if you like what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for $1 a month and get access to exclusive content like Drunk History, uh, original short stories, and some behind the scenes stuff that we're still working on. Aiden has promised me it will eventually come to light, but for now the archives seem to be sealed. Um, oh, the uh, exclusive bonus content for Patreon, like blooper reels and such. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they're coming. He says they are. Uh, Archie seems excited as well. You can also check out our Amazon storefront, which is linked in the description, or any of our sponsors. If you go to aidenmattis.card.co, that link is also in the description. We put a lot of links in the description. We hope you check them out. We also have a Target sponsorship. If you want to buy Target clothes, we recommend uh, Goodfellow & Co. We also have our Tableau Roasting Co. collaboration, Mount Pocono Perk, which is a delicious coffee blend that I myself designed with the help of Matt from Tableau. So, without any further uh, information to give you, I am Aiden Mattis. Thanks for stopping by the video.